Well, hello there. You're watching the press preview. A first look then at what is on the front pages as they come in. Uh, it's time to see what's making the headlines with the Independent's political editor, Andrew Woodcock, and the Telegraph's environment editor, Emma Gatton. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. Welcome and great to see both of you. So let's uh, start then with the front pages as ever. And documents seen by the eye indicate the government believes the UK will have largely stopped feeling the effects of the pandemic by 2023 or 2024. The Times leads with calls from the Prime Minister Boris Johnson for the French President Emmanuel Macron to block migrants crossing the Channel. The Daily Mirror has claims that the Duchess of Sussex told an aide that her husband, Prince Harry, was constantly berated by members of the royal family over Meghan's relationship with her father. The Daily Telegraph hears of government plans to lower the threshold at which students pay back their loans. And The Sun speculates over the romantic lives of the England footballer Jack Grealish and the actress Emily Attack. So let's uh, bring in our guests then, uh, Emma and Andrew. Uh, we're here in Glasgow. Let's start with that. Waiting until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, we're told, Andrew. Indeed. I mean, COP26 may well be the most important event going on in the world right at the moment, but it's not dominating the front pages tomorrow for a very obvious reason. That's because it hasn't got to a result. I think all of us, when we came here, we thought the deadline 6 p.m. on Friday. That will never be hit. These things always go to the last minute because everyone always thinks there's an advantage to be gained as long as the negotiation is going on. We're hopeful it will finish tomorrow, but uh, there's no guarantee of that. And the question, Emma, everybody be, will be looking at is, is it watered down? Is it weakened? Are there elements that are more ambitious? What's given up by one nation to get something back? The sort of the horse trading that's still happening tonight here. Yeah, absolutely. We've already had one revision of the draft text, and so we'll be looking tomorrow for those key elements on fossil fuel phase-out and coal phase-out to see if they're still in there and what it means for whether countries will come back next year with new targets. Well, that's the big question. Will they? There seems to be pushback from that, possibly from China, uh, a real sense that they want to get on with it in their own speed, for example. Uh, but let's take a look at The Guardian. It's, it, it's made the front pages, but in a, in a smaller way, has it not? Uh, and the question really is, can Alok Sharma bring nations together to keep the world on 1.5? Still no deal as the deadline passes. And 1.5 degrees is absolutely critical. The question is, what do they need to do? And is this idea of ratcheting up to bring people back year on year the way to do it? Well, the delegates and officials I've spoken to over the course of the day today, they all seem fairly confident that there will be a deal of sorts tomorrow. It will be a deal which will allow Alok Sharma to say that the, the hope of 1.5 as the maximum um, increase in, in temperatures, or average temperatures across the world, that that 1.5 will be still alive, but it won't be guaranteed at all. And I think the Probably the most significant thing to come out of the whole deal will be this speeding up of the ratchet mechanism. The idea that instead of every five years, as was agreed at Paris, that every year countries will have to come back and improve their um, offers on um, emissions reductions. Because the Paris deal was supposed to take us up to sort of, you know, 20, 30, 45 percent of, um, of emissions gone. 2030 isn't very far away now, and if you don't do it year by year, you've only got two five-year gaps between now and 2030, in fact, less than that. And, it, and indeed, the emissions targets of the nations show that by 2030, there will be more emissions and not a 45% reduction, which is, which is obviously uh, not what was meant to happen on 2010 figures. Um, but fossil fuels has been a key part of this, hasn't it? The debate about whether that line should be kept in. Saudi Arabia, we know, wants to take it out. There has been a suggestion that it was put in as a bargaining chip. And actually, it was one of the things that were going to be jettisoned. But now everyone thinks, of course it should be in there. This is about getting rid of fossil fuels and coal. And now people want to keep it in there. Is that, is that your understanding? Yeah, and actually, this is, this is at somewhere where the UK has really been able to show leadership. Because they, that was a, the, in the initial draft that was pulled together by the UK presidency. They put it in there almost as a kind of an optimistic punt, really. And they weren't expecting it to make it to the final draft. Um, but it has made it to the second draft. And what they are saying is that actually, when they have these conversations, countries are talking about this. And countries are saying, actually, we do want to see that in there in some format in the final text, which would be precedent setting for one of these summits. Absolutely. It's not been there before. We'll see if it hangs on in there uh, in the documents published at 8 o'clock in the morning. In terms of the money, the, the big issue here has been money as well. 
for effectively multiple things, for mitigation, which is getting rid of the emissions, for adaptation, which is dealing with the effects of, of climate change, and also for loss and damage, which in some people's mind, like America, could mean effectively reparations, a never-ending bill of this is what you did to my nation. You know, wh wh where do you see those three elements fitting in for what many of the poorer countries here are desperate for help, as we've heard throughout the summit? Well, this, this concept of loss and damage, it's a new one, really, here at this mm. summit, and it's not one that the, um, <coughs> the rich world has entirely mm. taken on board. And the idea being that you can pay people, to, or pay countries, rather, to adapt to the possibility of rising um, sea levels, of, of more frequent hurricanes and more frequent floods and so on. But the loss and damage which they suffer from an individual event can be absolutely massive. It can take up you know, a vast proportion of a small country's GDP. And the argument is that um, it's the rich world that caused the, um, the, uh, the problem with climate change and caused the extreme weather, um, and that they ought to be making some sort of reparations for that. And if you look at what happens, then that could be an absolutely gigantic bill, and we're nowhere near getting that agreed at uh, this summit. Well, they can't get the $100 billion that was promised back in 2009, can they? They're looking at maybe, what, $96 billion by the end of 2022? Possibly the, the $100 billion a year promise from the, uh, the richer nations to the poorer by 2023, which is a long time to wait when many, you know, the plaintive pleas from people here, we're feeling the effects right now. To the Matt cartoon, um, never want to shy. Uh, can we water down blah, blah, blah? Um, Emma, there's no doubt the youth movement has had a very big impact, but they're not here doing the negotiating right now. No, and it's really kind of amazing because it's, it's almost a two, you know, a two-track process because you have the, the protesters outside, and they're dealing with a sort of different, um, a different world than the, the negotiators that are inside this bubble. And the, the reality for the negotiators is just, just so different. They're dealing with the political boundaries of what their governments will allow them to do. But you do need to have the activists outside who are putting the pressure on those people inside to go that little bit further. And it is the later generations who will be impacted. We saw Franz Timmermans, who's here for the European Commission, holding up a photograph of his grandson and saying how much of the earth will be livable in by the time he hits uh, 40 years old. And this is where we're at, isn't it, now? That 1.2 is in many places causing havoc. What does 1.5 or 2.4 do which is the latest prediction from Climate Action Tracker based on the promises made at this summit. Well, I, I was speaking to one of the delegates earlier today who said that in dis discussions around the table, a lot of ministers from all over the world are now saying, this is what my children are saying to me. This is, you know, in discussions at home, they're saying to me, mm -hmm. Dad, you've got to, or Mum, you've got to sort this mm -hmm. out because this is the world I'm going to live in. And we've seen, you know, it's 1.1, 1.2 now. We, we're already seeing quite remarkable extreme weather events. Mm -hmm. Um, 1.5 will be worse than that, but um, you know, the experts tell us that that is still livable. Um, 2.4 degrees, which is what the um, climate tracker um, calculation is that the, the, the pledges from, from this summit would actually produce, that is very difficult to imagine, um, you know, lives like that. And I think Franz Timmermans has made a, you know, a very strong point talking about his grandchild actually being in a position of having to fight for food and fight for clean water which is, is sort of unimaginable from the, state, the position we're in now. Yes, global instability and human conflict. You know, you don't know where it ends, do you? But there's been progress, hasn't there? There's been a change in tone. Business, the corporate world is here. They're ready to fund the green future. And in terms of temperature too, before Paris, people said it was going to be six by the end of the century, then four after Paris, and now we're in the realm of two. So for you, as, as somebody who deals with this day in, day out, what is the progress that this has already delivered? I mean, what people who are inside these negotiations and have been at one COP meetings for, you know, decades will say is that they never imagined that they would have got to where they're getting now, that they would have kind of brought China, India, Saudi Arabia to the table to discuss what we're discussing here. So it, it has made a huge difference, you know, but, you know, has it been enough? That's, I think, a different question. Well, we'll wait and find out, won't we? Eight o'clock tomorrow morning, then they'll talk some more, then they'll talk some more. <laughs> and then by the afternoon, we might see if the gavel goes down on what has been a very interesting two weeks where, you know, the world is really reliant, or many parts of the world really reliant on what they hear here, and whether they come back again next year uh, to, again, as they put it, ratchet up people's 
pledges that they do. Should we move on to the pandemic? I mean, there's parallels, aren't there? The, uh, the scientific revolution that came with the pandemic, can it be used in climate? But the eye revealed uh, when the UK predicts the pandemic will end, uh, an exclusive they suggest, Whitehall's three scenarios for when public can forget about COVID-19. Uh, some might suggest, suggest the government is already hoping we feel like that. But uh, uh, what's your, your assessment of this, Andrew? Well, it's, it's interesting. I've not seen these, these um, dates before. If these are fi official predictions, I think people will be fascinated to, to see them. You know, the idea that we, COVID could be a routine disease by the end of next year on the best scenario, but on the worst scenario, we could still be struggling with it in 2026. If, you know, if I presume that, that, would, that would be the scenario where you've got... Um, new variants and where, you know, which, which um, get round vaccines and the idea that we're still um, you know, having lockdowns and other mitigations you know, five years hence is something that will make people shudder, I think. Yes, and certainly Tim Spector, who's done so much work uh, on his Zoe app in, in, get, in terms of people giving uh, their symptoms, it did suggest it could be up to eight years, didn't it? But let's have a look then. Optimistic prediction uh, sees the virus become routine disease in late 2022 or 23. A most likely situation is the world will escape the shadow of COVID in 2023 to 24, and the UK officials believe with vaccines, testing and antivirals preventing new lockdowns and the gloomiest forecast is for mass infections to continue until 2026 uh, but that's considered highly unlikely you know medicine's coming on all the time antivirals we know the UK has signed up to uh, testing we hope will continue some suggest that we need to be paying for it some at some point uh, vaccines as well we're all already into um, you know third primary jabs and boosters aren't we is that going to be it every four months we get another jab I mean, I think everyone's, everyone's hoping for that, aren't they? It's kind of like you want it to become just a kind of routine thing that you don't have to think about so much. I mean, being here, I think the kind of pandemic has been very present at the COP26 summit as well because there's been so many measures that they've had to put in place that it becomes, you know, almost overbearing, really. So I think for that would be kind of good news. But, yeah, 2026 is, a, is quite a gloomy outlook. Yes, indeed, yes. A daily lateral flow test for everybody in the building, mask wearing at all times. And as we heard in the plenary today, there's too many of you in here. Some of you will have to leave or sit in your seats. Did you hear yes. that? So, I mean, it's been difficult. And there has been a sense here that people feel that it's not been as inclusive as promised. Mm -hmm. The UK government had promised it would be an inclusive summit. Is that because people can't get into the rooms? And is that partly because of the pandemic? Well, that must have had an effect, I think. <coughs> I mean, it's, it has to be a limit on the, a limiter on the number of people who can be here. Um, I don't know to what extent that has, has uh, been the, the cause of uh, people being left outside or whether that's a security issue. Um, I mean, going around the, um, the centre, you do see a lot of activists, a lot of people from NGOs, from third parties, who are here to raise issues and not to actually be involved in the negotiations. And I think, um, you know, I've spoken to some of the organisers um, of the, um, the, the, the COP uh, presidency, and they say they want the people here who are making these um, noises, who are demanding change, because mm -hmm. they're representing the people outside. And they're, um, there's, it's an important reminder to the the, um, the politicians that um, this is uh, something that really I impacts on ordinary people, and which really concerns ordinary people. And to be fair, Boris Johnson turning his attention away from the COP26 summit to COVID today. Real concern across Europe, um, specifically the German speak, some of the German-speaking nations, about how cases are are rising and whether we once again see an uptick in cases here that they had been falling for many days. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously that's what we are all sort of fearing might happen, that we would have to come into another lockdown, especially with Christmas approaching and what, what that could mean for all of our kind of festive seasons. There we are again talking about Christmas. We can't, we can't go there. So Sleaz, something I'm sure uh, the uh, Tory party are watching very carefully because it's having an impact on the polls, according to the Daily Mail, Andrew. Yes, there's quite a remarkable poll on the front page of, um, of the Daily Mail today. After week, well, months and months of uh, comfortable leads over at Labour, well into to double figures only, only a few months ago, and after being at three points in the lead last week, um, Boris Johnson now finds himself six points behind Labour in this poll. Um, now, of course, you always have to take um, these sorts of things with a grain of salt because it is always the case that the most interesting polls are usually the ones that are wrong because they're the outliers. But it certainly it shows a direction of travel that um, is very concerning for Boris Johnson and for the Tory party because um, these sleaze allegations clearly are having an impact. Um, it's two weeks now almost that um, there's been virtually nothing on the front pages apart from COP and sleaze and 
series of allegations and uh, I'll use the word allegations, in fact some of them proven facts that, uh, mm. that Conservative Party um, MPs had been paid for lobbying and so on, and that the Prime Minister attempted to cover it up and attempted to, to effectively neuter the um, Standards Commission, um, which, which looks into these things in Parliament. Or just earned a lot of money for a second job at a time when everybody else at home is finding the cost of living, gas prices, you name it, is on the way up. And it's that sort of contrast, isn't it, for, for many people, despite the, that Boris Johnson has been, until what looks like now, the kind of Teflon Prime Minister. Yeah, we've seen reports that concerns over Tory sleeves are the highest that they've been since the 1990s, which is obviously going back, you know, that's overshadowing even the expenses scandal, so it's not looking great, and it has been sort of dominating the headlines even when Boris Johnson came here to Glasgow. He faced a lot of questions about this. A uh, quick word then on this story. Uh, Megan Shockley and Royals constantly berated Harry. Uh, this is further revelations in the court case with the, about the Mail on Sunday. Yeah, I think this just goes to show that um, the long-standing tradition of the royals not going to court to fight um, uh, privacy cases or, or cases of uh, um, you know, inaccuracies, in the, or as they see them in the press, that that tradition was a very wise tradition. I think as soon as the royals are in the court, regardless of the rights and wrongs of the case, what happens is that um, the details of their, their private discussions, of their, their intimate lives, become the fodder for public discussion. And some would say that's a great thing if the, the royal family is opened up to the, um, to the scrutiny of the public, but uh, I wouldn't imagine that the royal family are among the people who think that. No, indeed so. As the details emerge, it's day two, isn't it, of, uh, of Jason Knauf and uh, the revelations from him. Uh, Emma Gatton, Andrew Woodcock, thank you both very much, Lee. We'll see you shortly for more.